Uh, why don't we jump into the moment that I'm sure many people are waiting for as far as the animals and inhabitants you can have in these types of vivariums or, or polydariums. I think maybe let's start with the aquatic side and s- s- some of the again, this kind of doubles back to what I had originally said is that quite often the water feature in a paludarium is quite small. So it is difficult in, unless you're dealing with, you know, the Shinosaurus like Dion is most of the time you're not dealing with animals that are taking up quite a lot of space. So what are some animals that you can put into, into the water feature, whether it fish, inverts or, or amphibians, maybe uh, Tanner, did you want to start with that one? Then we'll go to Dion. Yeah, sure. If we're speaking with the water feature, smaller nano species of fish sell so out of the rasbora you got a phoenix phoenix rasbora exclamation point they could safely live in five gallons roughly so if you have a good you know enough volume then you can get away with it i would say something also to consider is when you're thinking of an aquatic space five gallons is not always five gallons and what i mean by that is if you have five gallons and it's a lot of vertical space the fish can't use that as much, but if you have an area where the water is maybe two inches thick, but it's a large swimming area back and forth, you could actually keep some larger fish in there because that that's the space they need typically, the back and forth. They don't need all this um, vertical space, so could consider that. But I would say, yeah, a lot of the rasbora, some tetra, endlers, so endlers, live bears, they, they can typically go pretty small. Um, some species of Danios, although uh, others get pretty big and th- they're an active fish, so they need a decent amount of swimming room back and forth. Obviously you have all your shrimp. So your cherry shrimp, I mean, they're bulletproof. Everybody loves them. They're a good option. Sometimes you could get away with a mono shrimp, but they're, they get a little bit larger. So you probably want five gallons or more. Any type of snails, people who watch my channel, they know I love my snails, pest snails, whatever kind of snail, throw them in there. They're good to have around. So (laughs) Malaysian trumpet snails, bladder snails. I really like ram's horn snails. Just beneficial to have around. You have scuds, so little um, sea shrimp, that type of thing. How do you how do you get scuds? Like uh, scuds are almost like a springtail equivalent in the water in a way, right? They're like a little small kind of invert cleanup crew type thing. It, yeah. Where do you get them? So I got my original culture from a fish store. They were all in the planted tank, and I'm like, I see you have scuds in here. Are you selling them? And they're like, ah, not really. I'm I'm like, well, I'll buy some. Can you get me some? And so they went through and got I don't know maybe twenty of them, and now I have probably thousands of them so i would say that's a good option ebay pe- people sell them like that it, it's it's one of those things where you kind of need to know a, a fellow hobbyist that has them and they'll, they'll just be like oh yeah here you can have them type yeah, of yeah. deal but how, how important do you see them in the ecosystem i don't use them in a lot of my tanks it's only okay. specific ones but i think moving forward i kind of want them in most of my stuff they're yeah, think of them like a springtail. They they shred everything up. They help clean things. I will say though that if they're not completely fed, they'd like to nibble on your leaves and stuff. So if you want pristine foliage, they might not be the best option. Okay. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good to know. Uh Dion, do you have anything to add to water inhabitants? Um, are we talking about just like general critters you'd want to keep? Yeah, and- anything. Any anything that comes yeah. to mind. Whether it doesn't have to be fish or invert, you could whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah, also just to add, like, to, because you didn't mention them by name, Tanner, but like, I like knee right snails. I think you didn't mention them, but yeah, like, those are also super cool. I mean, they yeah. have a problem, though. Yeah. The, the eggs. That is true. It's funny you mentioned that because I have eggs all over my shoes. I quit, I quit them. using them because of that. It's funny. Because they <laughs> yeah. lay eggs and they don't reproduce really. In yeah, do they need right? brackish? <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, there you go. Case closed. Yeah, I have <laughs> eggs all over my glass right now in the wood. So, but like I have found that they're pretty efficient at cleaning things. So, I mean, now maybe I'll have to go back and pick the species you talked about. <laughs> I mean, there's so many cool varieties though, and they're long lived. So I get it. I mean, I've had at least 15 different species that I could think of, and they're mm-hmm. cool. But whenever you're trying to have a pristine scape or whatever, and you have these hard little yeah. things that are extreme difficult to scrape off i i just at some point i'm like i can't deal with this anymore 
<laughs> but, but Tanner, fair. what about the, um, you, you mentioned like pest snails that you will even accept those. I mean, I've had those and when I had cichlids get really carried away, how, how do you maintain their population? Are you using like assassin snails or something in there to, no? I do have assassin snails in some of my setups, but I find that it's very, especially in the setups with botanicals. So you have your leaf litter and all that kind of stuff. They're populations are dictated by food. So if you have a lot of food for them to pull from, they'll be prolific. If food's not as prolific, then they die back. So really how your environment set up dictates how many snails you have. Mm -hmm. So okay. like you'll see a lot of beginner aquarists, right? They're doing their thing. And then all of a sudden I've got a million snails and yeah. you're probably overfeeding your fish. And so then the snails have something to eat and then they become prolific. So I would say that they're, think of them as an indicator species. If you got a mm. lot of them, they got food. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Um, Diane, do you have anything else to add into the water? I, I mean, like, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself. I mean, I, I would like to hear more of Tanner's experience because I haven't set mine up that way yet, but I would think like vampire crabs are super cool. And, but it's more of like the transition, like they're, they're in both environments. In fact, more terrestrial, but they, I think, I don't know. It's interesting. Like when you're thinking about the paludarium too, like all the fish that you want to choose, you really have to remember how you're going to use that space. If you have enough room to add a heater and all these different elements too, because like in some cases, like you're, you're just taking more and more space away. I mean, there's all sorts of creative ways that you can add heaters to like a, um, like a back component that you've created sort of like what Tanner was describing before, where you, you, maybe it's a reservoir or in the same space as the pump, if you can do it. And, um, but you have to, you know, take all that into consideration when you're choosing what species you're going to add. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know, I, I like to use, I, I find myself using more, uh, fish, at least in my builds that like don't require heaters. Um, but that's just been my experience because like with the shinisaurus i'm not doing that and um even with the croc skinks or or my glass frog tank i have with it's a paludarium too it's mostly just um yeah species that can handle not having a heater and seems to be working well yeah that that's a really good point that uh, i probably should have brought up earlier was heating the water T tanner do you typically use species kind of like dion where you're not having to heat the water and if you do how do you I do it I heat very few of my aquariums. I heat I heat the vampire crab tank and I heat my saltwater tank and that's it. And I use a lot of species that prefer warmer waters like bettas and things of that nature. But one of the aspects to heating a tank that I think often gets overlooked is that all of the other mechanical components you're using heat up the water itself. So the impeller in your pump, that heats up the water a little bit. Then you also have your lights that heats up the water a little bit. Is the tank completely sealed up? That heats the water up a little bit, right? So the heater is just kind of filling the gap, if you will. But I keep my, just the way my room's set up in the basement and stuff, it's pretty consistently between about 74 to 78 Fahrenheit. So I find that that's equivalent or like it works well for pretty much everything that I want to keep. And I don't, I don't have any issues. Okay. Yeah, that that's good to know. Uh, do you want to touch on the vampire crab success, or how, like like how does that how is that uh, enclosure working? Is it successful, sure. or is there is there issues with it? Um, my only issue with it is that the condensation. Well, it's not really condensation, but the um mineral buildup of the water on the front is a little more than I would like. But it's just kind of the way that the water is splashing off of stuff. It it's just creating more of a a blockage than I expected. So I got to find some way to get around that. But I also, you don't see them very much. They're very reclusive. I, I knew they were, but I think I expected them to be out more than I, than I do. And so I'll go maybe three or four days. I don't see them. And then seven days in a row, I'll see most of them out, out and about doing their thing. So it, it's really interesting to kind of learn their behaviors. Um, I find that, they at least mine when I see them, when I see them out, they're typically near the water, which would make sense because otherwise they want to be buried in the dirt and that type of thing. And the way that my thing is set up, all the land areas are kind of hidden behind the waterfall. So if they're back there, I <laughs> there's really mm -hmm. no way to see them. <laughs> um, but 
yeah, th they're cool. I, I like them. They're pretty interesting, easy to care for from what I've I've been able to tell so far. And if if you want something that you don't mind, you don't see it that often with interesting behaviors and stuff, you definitely like them. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that is a neat species for sure. Well, why don't we just quickly discuss some of the above water species? And, you know, you don't necessarily have to think about things that you've done personally, but are there like reptiles or amphibians that come to the top of your head that you think would work very well for a paludarium? Like I said, you don't have to have the experience with that species, but since you each have experience with paludariums, maybe you know kind of what works and what doesn't. And and uh, maybe I, I'd be curious to know if even some snakes come to mind as well, because there's probably people that might want to do books potentially both. So Diane, did you want to start with that one? Sure. To put you um, on the spot. Yeah, no, you're fine. <laughs> I, I mean, like, uh, some of the species that come to mind right away, a lot of amphibians, obviously. Um, like uh, as a kid, I guess it's funny as I'm, as I'm talking, I'm like, you know what? I've actually done more paladins than I realized. <laughs> I only got like 10. I, I mean, I used to keep fire bellied toads and, I think they're a great option and I won't speak too much to it because I know Tanner can talk a lot more about them and how awesome they are. So those come to mind, a few species of newt that I like fire bellied newts and um, there's all kinds like those Turkish newts people have now. I can't remember the name of them uh, off the top of my head, but uh, there's a few species that are pretty popular, even Spanish rib newts, but they're mostly staying in the water. Um, and then even, you know, like I keep crocodile skinks. Um, they... They can be kept in a paludarium. I would probably suggest having a setup that isn't super deep for them. Like they can swim and they'll dive in when they're afraid. But I just I like thinking about it or at least being very clear that the build allows for them to easily get out of the water with branches or roots or whatever it is. Uh, but they they do. I've seen some pretty massive builds and super cool. Like they love to go into the water and swim. Yeah. So I, I think they're an awesome option um, for snakes. I think garter snakes get overlooked a lot. I know that um, depending maybe in the states where you're from, there might be some species that you can't keep. But uh, I think they're they're underrated. Like they they're very active, they're interesting, and they they can do well in a paludarium setup. Same with uh, rhinoceros rat snakes. They will spend a lot of time around and in water too. So anything that's like not enormous and going to produce a lot of waste, and then obviously you have to then account for that with like your filtration and what you're doing. I think those are probably more of the beginner or just generally easier to work with species because yeah like with a lot of these larger animals they're producing large volumes of waste like even as a, like a hypothetical if you had a ball python and you could somehow keep it that way like the amount of waste that animal produces eating a whole rat going into the water like that's a lot of waste to have to manage right so i think of like smaller colubrids and things like that or um yeah i don't know I want to leave something for Tanner to share. Yeah, so. no, those are great. What about you, Tanner? Are there things that you've used that have come that have been great, or things that come to mind as great I, options? I mean, yeah. Well, there's a lot of larger animals. I think the one that immediately comes to mind is anacondas. I mean, mm, that's true. What, what, what? There's a lot of snakes that obviously would work, but that's like a aquatic snake. Like it just immediately comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Most frog, pretty much any frogs, really, because they they like to soak in water and that type of thing. Um, obviously, you mentioned about the fire belly toads. I mean, they're not as prevalent these days because the only ones typically that you're going to see now are captive bred. Whereas 15 years ago or whatever, they were just wild catching them all, and they were dirt cheap and stuff like that so they're they're not as prevalent these days but they're just such an awesome animal they have silly communal behaviors they bark to each other they create these little hierarchies and stuff and they're just perfect for that type of setup um i would i don't know pretty much if if the animal lives in an area where it's around water naturally then it's suitable for a paludarium i i think i'll just keep it pretty general <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Totally. I mean, I have a rainbow boa, so that's the same sort of thing, like very similar to anaconda where they, and there's nothing, so it's, I guess it would be the closest thing I have to a paludarium. You guys can see on this camera or over this shoulder, that's like a, 
like a little pond that I have in there. And I don't, I, maybe it's like eight gallons or something. And it is really cool seeing her in there and watching how she can hide. And, and a lot of times I'm like, I don't think she can breathe, but you see, you find her nose, like the tip of her nose just out of the water, those sort of things. But when she poops in that thing, <laughs> it's just such a mess. It's like, oh, it's, yeah. it's like I got to like reserve a day of like cleaning it and like, and it's not set up at all to handle any waste. So it's like, you know, something that doesn't happen very often, but it's definitely something where if you were to put a large animal in an enclosure, you need to have um, a waste management system. What about like, if you were to combine, like, I think like a lot of like small anoles and things like that, I think would work well in sort of the, uh, the um, terrestrial side, but I mean, maybe neither of you have thought about this, but as far as like co having things like that, like with maybe like the fire belly toads and, and newts, do you ever, or not newts, anoles, do you ever think about like, is there clashing there or is this something that as long as you're dealing with somewhat smaller animals and they each have their own habitat that you don't think it would be an issue. And maybe you don't have enough experience with that specific, you know, area to, to, to answer on, but if any, <laughs> well, either of you want to jump on it. I actually kept anoles with my fire belly toads when I first got them they all the anoles managed to escape i mean this was probably at least 12 years ago right so i was not as good at what what i do as i was so whatever they they made their way out and i never <laughs> found them unfortunately the only issue with fire belly toads is i get technically they're toxic i never had an issue with them killing fish or anything like that so so there is that concern to some extent um but yeah, I mean, I think an obvious solution is to find animals that actually cohabitate naturally. So do, do they live in similar niches and areas? Um, but uh, yeah, uh, otherwise, yeah, are they small enough not to eat each other? Or, yeah. you know, of, of similar size and they're not going to battle, then pro probably it could work. Yeah. Dion, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, this is a conversation I have quite frequently with friends of mine too that are fellow friends in the hobby and um i don't know it's a tough one because i think in some ways it can be absolutely fascinating to see how these animals can occupy the same space and hopefully get along or maybe it's something you're doing because you want to have like a natural order of things where Maybe you're adding an inhabitant to, for example, like the assassin snails, regulate the population of another species. So there, there are elements where people will, will systematically do it for that purpose. Or like, you know, you're adding vampire crabs to the build where you have all these powder blue isopods taking over because you know that they're going to just hunt them all down to a manageable, manageable number or worse. I think where the issue lies for me at least is at the end of the day, you're kind of doing it for you. And I think there's like a fine line between compromising. Like, I wouldn't want to do anything where I'm like stressing one species out. And I think that mm -hmm. can be the tricky thing. Sometimes like, especially if amphibians, they could be super opportunistic, They're just going to try and eat like anything they can fit in their mouth in a lot of cases. Like, I think there are some species like red eyed tree frogs I've worked with a bit off and on. Like, I don't think they're as ravenous, but like a white tree frog, you know, you, you, they try to eat you half the time you're trying to tong feed them. So I don't know. I think just like there are ways it can work, but it's also you have to be conscientious that. It is like for your own pleasure and you want to try, I think, to navigate it in a way. Maybe that's kind of vague, but just to say that like you're not going to compromise the animals like because they're at complete mercy to how you're choosing to keep them. So if you can do it that way, you're not going to like, you know, not add a basking light because one inhabitant won't benefit from it, but the other really needs it. Like if you can do it all right and really research and like kind of how Tanner said, like find species that actually cohabitate naturally too or um i think it can be very rewarding and super interesting but i also think it could backfire too if you're not really thinking it through before doing it because i see a lot of people are like oh i want to do all these cohab builds it looks so cool but there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into making that decision ahead of it